Thank you, thank you, Jerry, for that introduction. And it's, it's a great pleasure to be back at Williams with uh, many of my old friends and, and former students and, and colleagues and, and people I've talked about growth with. And uh, the students here are, uh, are always so enthusiastic and interesting to talk to. So it's a lot of fun to be here. Now, when Q invited me to present this talk, he said, you know, you're going to be the keynote speaker after dinner speaker. And so I kind of thought after dinner speaker meant everyone would have their, their dessert in front of them and maybe a drink or two. And it'd be kind of a jolly thing. And, and my co-authors and I thought that would be a good place to trot out this paper. Uh, <laughs> this, is, this is the first presentation of this paper. There's, there's really nothing more than what's on the slides here. It's not written. Um, and uh, so, so kindly judge uh, <laughs> what we have. So uh, the starting point for this is actually the paper that Jerry referred to, uh, measuring economic growth from outer space. And so here's the kind of data that, that got us motivated. So this is something that uh, I had as a screensaver even before I started working on the topic. This is a photo mosaic of lights observed by uh, US satellites uh, over the Earth. Um, and you can see it's got all sorts of interesting uh, stuff. Here's kind of a, a close up of, of kind of Europe and, and the Middle East and India and the Arabian Peninsula. Um, and you can see just even kind of casually looking at this, you can, you can learn something about the underlying reality. You can see where cities are. Uh, you can see uninhabited regions. You can see differences between rich countries and poor countries, say comparing uh, India and Europe and so on. And that's what we set out to explore both in the last paper and, and in the the several papers that we're writing now. So let me talk first about the data that underlies this picture. So these are US Air Force weather satellites. They pass over every point at the Earth, on the Earth sometime between 8.30 and 10 uh, PM local time. There are all sorts of things that they have to deal with about the lunar cycle and the aurora borealis and cloud cover and stuff like that, uh, which we mostly understand. Uh, and they kind of take those things out. And so what we get is the average light visible on cloudless dark nights over the course of the year. Um, and uh, what's really cool is that we now have 20 years of this data, 21 years of this data. So we have annual averages for this period, 1992 to 2012. So for those of us old enough to remember the start of the empirical literature on economic growth, all of that stuff, Romer's paper, Barrow's paper, my own paper, uh, started with 25 years of panel data. So we are kind of closing in on the horizon where we can really look at growth over time in this data as well as cross sections. Although all of what I'm going to show you today is cross sections, we're, we're working on the other stuff. So the underlying data are in what we'll call pixels, which are 30 arc seconds uh, by 30 arc seconds of longitude or latitude. So at the equator, that's slightly less than one kilometer by one kilometer. And here's what the data look like um, uh, for a place that some of us know well, which is Providence. So here's Narragansett Bay. Um, here's Providence and Warwick and Cranston. That's New Bedford. That's Newport. Uh, you can see sort of there's, there's a lot of very fine uh, local variation uh, in this. So it's just an incredibly, incredibly rich form of, of data for looking at the world up close. Um, this is some raw data. Uh, which is a little cut off there, um, but that's okay. Uh, from, uh, so this is again from the early paper. This is what's called uh, the calibrated lights data. So it's on a scale of uh, zero to 63. Um, and I'm not gonna go into all the, the details of it. Um, I guess you can't really see the sides of these things. Can I try pulling this over? Is that gonna make it? No, nope. that wasn't good. <laughs> you know what? I won't worry about it. It's, it's OK. It's, it's right. the only slide that's going to use that. So anyway, here you see kind of uh, uh, just how the data is broken down. This top row that you can't see labeled is the fraction of pixels that are unlit. So you see in the United States, about 72% of pixels have a value of 0. In the Netherlands, that's 1% of <laughs> pixels. Here you see the average digital number. So here in the Netherlands, it's 23. In the United States, it's four. When we go over to Mozambique, it's 0 0.04. And in Mozambique, 99.5% of pixels are unlit. Um, and then you can see the distribution of various values 
Uh, and then, you know, sort of one thing you see from this, which I'll stress as we go on, is that clearly there are effects here from both income per capita, so rich countries uh, holding density constant produce more light, and there's also effects from population density. So when you have a lot of people, you get more light visible from space. Um, this is just a cool picture of the Korean Peninsula showing you kind of how you can measure changes over time. So there's Pyongyang, which actually gets darker over this period. Uh, this is kind of, you know, the famous difference between South Korea and North Korea just kind of shows you the importance of borders or institutions. And you can also see, you know, kind of the Seoul metro area uh, getting bigger. Uh, this is data that's actually in my textbook of, you know, kind of looking over 10 years in Europe. And you can see, for example, Poland gets much lighter over this 10-year period. Uh, and Ukraine gets darker over this 10-year period, and that matches up the, the, with the data on relative income growth. Okay, so what do the lights tell us? So almost all the light visible from space is the result of electric lighting. Uh, there are things like gas flares and uh, forest fires that can be taken out of the data. You can spend a lot of time uh, messing with that. And as I said, electric light visible from space is a function of both population density and income per capita. And in the previous paper, we did the most boring possible thing we could do with this data, which was to aggregate it up to the level of countries and just ask how good a proxy is it for income growth. So this was kind of the key picture in the other paper. So on the horizontal axis is the change in average lights between the period 92, 93 and 05, 06 in logs. And on the vertical axis, is the change in total GDP, uh, in the log of total GDP over the same period. And there's this positive relationship between the two. And in that paper, what we said is, you know, if you're a rich country, you've got good measures of GDP. And so knowing that lights go up when GDP goes up is not all that interesting. For poor countries where GDP is measured extremely poorly, the growth of lights is an alternative measure or a proxy for the growth of actual GDP. It's a terrible measure. It's full of measurement error. But the measurement error in lights is orthogonal or unrelated to the measurement error in GDP per capita. And so having two bad measures of something is better than having one bad measure of something. But as I say, that was really boring stuff um, because it throws away 99% of the interesting stuff in the data. And in terms of levels, cross-country income differences are pretty well measured already. So improving the measurement using light state is not that exciting. And uh, cross-country income differences, oh, I'm sorry, and cross-country empirics have been beaten to death by me and other people. <laughs> uh, and so I don't want to do that anymore. Um, and so what we're going to be thinking about in this paper is using the lights data as a way of understanding the spatial <laughs> distribution of population and economic activity in the world as a whole, but in particular within countries, because um, that's you know, sort of where there's uh, a need for better data. And then this is kind of, I think, a, a point that we're mulling over in our head. Most of the spatial variation in income, so if I took sort of the whole world and I kind of looked at average income over square kilometers of that, most of that variation, I'm sorry, average income per capita over square kilometers in the world, most of the variation in that comes from country differences, from the North Korea, South Korea thing that you saw there. Within a country, sort of, institutions are held constant. And within a country, income tends to be more equal than it is between countries. And so when I look at light variation within a country, that's generally being driven by population distribution. So light data is giving me sort of information on where people live. So, what can we say about the spatial distribution of population? So here's my thought experiment. So uh, you're trying to kind of start with a blank slate. I mean, we know about the spatial distribution of population. You, you, you could tell me a lot about it, I'm sure. But imagine you're captured by aliens. <laughs> and the aliens say to you, this is what we've been looking at. We've been looking at the lights visible from space. And that's the only thing we know about people. We have some other remote sense data, maybe. But you know, we, don't, we don't know anything else. We don't know why. Well, we know that these lights reflect population density. We don't know why a lot of people live here and over here, and not a lot of people live over there, or something like that. 
How would you kind of, starting from a clean <coughs> slate, explain to the aliens what determines the spatial pattern of population? It's a really cool kind of question because we take these things for granted. We take for granted, I guess Paris isn't here. That's Rome, yes? Oh, is that Paris? Okay, all right, there we go. So there's Paris, there's Rome, Naples, uh, Cairo's in there, Istanbul's in there. So we kind of know that there are these places that have a lot of people, right, the low countries. Uh, we know there are places that don't have a lot of people. Uh, and we have some stories for why that is. And I just want to be a little more systematic about thinking about that. So here's, I think, what you would tell the aliens. So you would say, first of all, you know, you'd explain about people and how we work and, you know, it can't be too cold or too hot or we're uncomfortable and we have to eat. And so there are some places where it's kind of better to uh, produce output or to grow food or some places that are just fundamentally nice to live in, like in San Diego or something, uh, and other places that are not so nice to live in, like I can get myself in trouble there. <laughs> Every place is nice to live in. <laughs> but uh, there are some places that are harder to live in, right? It's harder to live in Tibet uh, than it is to live in, in uh, Paris. Um, and so you could explain about kind of there are these natural characteristics that lead some places to be more attractive than others. And we're going to call that first nature. And then you have to explain to them about agglomeration. So you'd have to say, well, there are a lot of things we do, uh, both kind of uh, social activities or income producing activities where it's very helpful to have people together, to have people agglomerated. You can take advantage of uh, economies of scale and division of labor and thick markets and all sorts of externalities that result from bringing people together. And that's one reason that we're not kind of all spread evenly across the globe. Um, but then you could also explain that, that there are limits on the value of agglomeration because there are also disamenities of agglomeration. There's congestion, there's pollution and stuff like that. Uh, and there's also kind of the uh, cost of bringing food, which even in this modern age, we still grow with land uh, to where the people are because everyone's got to eat. Um, and so those things are going to kind of work against each other. And so as I wrote here, people agglomerate, but they don't all agglomerate in one place. So there are these kind of centers of agglomeration uh, that are out there. And that's why even if the land were all the same, there would be this lumpiness to human population. And that's one thing we see on the map. And then the third thing you would talk about uh, is persistence, what's sometimes called second nature, which is that once agglomerations of people get put somewhere, they tend to stay and they tend to even grow sometimes. And why is that? Well, you know, you can talk about it in terms of long-lived capital, like we build a bunch of roads and bridges uh, to a city. Uh, or you could just think of it as equilibrium selection that maybe, you know, we're going to have an agglomeration somewhere. We might as well have the agglomeration where we've always had the agglomeration. Uh, or maybe, you know, I've been thinking more and more that this has to do with kind of political power, that, you know, cities uh, don't like to be told, hey, you know, this is no longer a good place for a city. We've decided to get rid of it. Cities do their best, or, or their residents do their best to maintain where they are. So, that, so I think of that as kind of inertia in the locations of agglomeration. So what more can we say about these things? So first nature, uh, those are things that are persistent. So the climate, the soil, the ruggedness, or something like that. But you might think of the, what I call the prices attached to these uh, characteristics is changing over time. So the value that we put on different characteristics. So prior to air conditioning, uh, there were lots of places like Houston uh, where like no one would ever want to live uh, because for four months a year, it's just like death. <laughs> Six? <laughs> Six months a year, it's kind of like death. Um, uh, but once we invent air conditioning, then Houston becomes a perfectly fine place to live. Irrigation takes places that are not good to grow food in and, and makes it possible uh, to grow food in. Uh, as countries grow richer, you might attach more weight to an amenity like a pleasant climate. You know, maybe our, my ancestors who lived in you know, Poland five, six generations ago, they, you know, they wanted the extra 100 calories in their diet. They didn't really care about a nice uh, climate because, because they were always on the margin of starvation. Um, as countries get richer, people uh, spend less of their consumption basket on food and rising agricultural productivity means that fewer people can produce all the food that folks want to eat. And so you can have this divorce between where people live 
and where you grow food. Um, and uh, I guess falling transport costs do the same thing, so uh, we don't have to have people near food producing areas. And maybe as countries uh, get richer and industrialized, uh, the value of trade increases. That's something we're going to pursue in this paper. So maybe uh, living in places where it's easier to trade becomes more valuable over time. Um, then as far as agglomeration and congestion go, kind of the same thing is true. So there's benefits of agglomeration and costs of congestion, but those are specific to the level of technology or the level of income per capita, and these things change over time. So if we think about sort of you know, the benefits or costs of living in a city, so without modern uh, clean water or sewage infrastructure or antibiotics, cities would be really, really bad places to live. And you, you wouldn't have so many big cities because the people in them would be dying at too high a rate. Um, so technology kind of makes that kind of agglomeration more possible. Um, industrial structure and type determine the benefits of agglomeration. And I just threw this in the end. You know, you would think that modern communication technology, so Skype and, and uh, you know, free telephone calls and all that, should lower the benefit of co-location. So I think, you know, sort of when all of us thought about what the internet was going to do, we thought, well, everyone can live in their little rural household and, you know, telecommute to work and, and do everything uh, without having to commute into the center of a big city. And that has totally not happened. So all the evidence is that increased uh, modern communication makes people want to live together in cities more. And I don't understand, I mean, I, I understand that that has happened. I just don't, I can't convince myself that's a permanent thing. Uh, so I think maybe we'll all be living in the countryside soon. All right. And then finally, persistence. So we have many examples of, of places where the locations of cities are determined by history. So Mexico City is a good example. So the Spanish put their capital there because they took it away from the Aztecs and they wanted to sort of show the Mexicans that they were the bosses now. Um, what I didn't know until I looked into it is that Mexico City uh, was not an old city when the Spanish took it over. You know, the Aztecs and, and their allies had sort of formed some confederation and built this city in the middle of a lake, uh, on an island in the middle of a lake, a couple of hundred years before the Spanish uh, took over. Um, but the city is still there. The lake has been filled in. Whatever was good about that place, as far as the Aztecs are concerned, is surely irrelevant today. It may even be a negative uh, factor today. But nonetheless, this is where the, the capital of Mexico is in this, in this massive agglomeration. And then the other example, and I, I really do give this example even when I'm not at Williams, uh, <laughs> is Williams. <laughs> so, so, you know, presumably Williams College was put here because this was a relatively densely populated part of the country, populated by people who valued education, at a time when transport, you know, when you brought your son over to university, you load up the, the wagon and, and drive him over with his, his iMac and stuff. Uh, <laughs> and um, this was a good place for that. But times have changed. This may or may not be a good place for a college to be. It's, it's really far from everywhere. Um, but Williams College is, is persistent here and presumably will be uh, forever. Uh, so this persistence really matters. So one of the big ideas that, that we have in this paper is that um, because of the importance of agglomeration, there are going to be concentrations of population, but where those are could be many, many different possible equilibria. So there could be many different places Williams College or, or Providence uh, could be. And any of them can be in equilibrium in the sense that if we sort of designate that as where the agglomeration is going to be, then it will, will have an equilibrium where that's where the agglomeration is. Those equilibria can vary in efficiency. And historical persistence may select an equilibrium, and it may select an inefficient equilibrium. Um, and I, again, I'm not enough of an expert, so someone can tell me afterwards. I think of Bombay as kind of sort of being a very inefficient equilibrium, and it was kind of a good place to have a port, but now you have this very big city on this teeny little spit of land. And so, uh, you know, if you were kind of redesigning India today, you would put that big city. Uh, somewhere that was easier to get to. Um, and so here's the policy thing. Q said I should talk about the role of policy. So in not yet urbanized countries, or in countries that are urbanizing rapidly, you can think of this as a real lever for policymakers in sort of determining which of these equilibria will obtain and figuring out which, that, which the efficient urban or spatial equilibrium uh, is. Okay. So um, 
to sort of set up the things I want to look at. So we see there's persistence, but we don't know whether that's kind of this agglomeration inertia or persistent natural advantages. Um, and just observing that there's persistence doesn't really tell us which of those there is. I'll talk briefly about two papers uh, from the literature that are kind of well known for looking at this. Uh, and there are a few others I could talk about as well. So one is this very famous paper by uh, Blakely and Lynn uh, called Portage and Path Dependence. This is a kind of geography uh, as a natural experiment uh, paper. So there's this geographical feature called the fall line. So the fall line is if you think about a river going to the sea, the fall line is the place where the last rapids or waterfall is before the river is flat to the ocean. So the fall line is the place that you can sail to in an ocean going ship before you have to stop. Um, and it's particularly pronounced in the southeast US. And in early development, this was the natural place to have a trading post because you had to transship goods here. And so a lot of trading posts in cities kind of arose at the falls line. Um, and then in early industrialization, the waterfalls also provided power. Uh, so Pawtucket, Rhode Island is, is actually on the falls line and was a place where there was early industrialization. But none of this has mattered for more than 100 years. We haven't had water powered factories and, and we haven't had, you know, we've had railroads and stuff like that. So all of these things have been irrelevant. Um, in the US, there are many big cities that are on fall lines or also portage locations, which are somewhat similar. So there's a list of them. And what Blakely and Lynn find is that cities on the fall line in modern times don't grow any more slowly than other cities. So here are cities that had a natural advantage, a reason for being in a place. We took that reason away, and it doesn't seem to matter. So it's sort of evidence that kind of history determines where the agglomerations happen. But once the agglomerations start, they kind of keep going. So that's a very much sort of agglomeration inertia view. There's this paper by Davis and Weinstein that looks at Japan that sort of draws a very different conclusion. So they look at data. Actually, here I talk about 1,500 years of data. They actually have like a couple of thousand if you use their other data set. Um, and the big finding there is that there are these persistent differences in, in, in uh, population density among regions in Japan. There are regions that always have higher density uh, than other ones. Um, and then when industrialization starts, the ones that are most dense are the ones where agglomeration happens and these regions kind of separate uh, from the others. And they interpret this as saying that it's really about first nature, that the more dense regions just have better natural characteristics uh, than the other ones. And that selects where agglomeration takes place. And they test this by sort of thinking of this natural experiment. So the natural experiment I often think of in the case of the US, sort of on the, on the Williams College uh, model is, suppose someone came to you and said, you know what, we're going to start again with the US. So what I want you to do is take these 330 million people and these, I don't know how much capital is there in the US, like 20 trillion or 30, no two times GDP, like a $30 trillion or something. Take all this capital and all these people and put them where they best fit now with modern technology. So we would take the small liberal arts colleges and we would scatter them, some in New England, but many in non-New England places and so on. So if you wiped the slate clean and got rid of the influence of history, we would have a very different spatial equilibrium. At least that's what urban economists think. So it's a little macabre, but they think of the sort of the bombing in World War II as this kind of natural experiment. So they look at sort of cities that were bombed and not bombed and kind of ask to what extent that changed the spatial distribution. And the answer they get is not at all. And this is sort of the most famous picture from their paper. Um, the two cities that had atomic bombs, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So you can see uh, population, log of population in Hiroshima uh, in the period before World War II draw a trend line based on that. Here's the actual population. So there's a huge decline uh, as a result of the atomic bombing. And within a few decades, you're right back on the trend line. And the same thing is true for Nagasaki. And so their conclusion from this is that there are sort of these persistent natural uh, characteristics that lead agglomerations to take place in these places, even though the slate was almost literally wiped clean. OK, so what are we going to do in this paper? We're going to assess this kind of inertia versus natural advantage in a more systematic fashion. Uh, we're going to assess the impact on spatial settlement of, of some changing prices of natural characteristics and transport costs uh, and derive some implications. We don't actually do this, these two things. So I won't talk about that. <laughs> yeah.
<laughs> so here's our empirical setup. So uh, we're going to take that lights data that I showed you before, and we're going to aggregate it up to a somewhat more manageable unit. So we're going to use quarter degree longitude by latitude uh, data. So each of our grid cells is going to be a 30 by 30 square of those underlying pixels that I showed you. Uh, so it measures, there you see, 777 square kilometers. And we've got 250,000 of them. So the world's a very big place. And we've got a lot of uh, observations. Um, this is the underlying lights data. I'm not going to go, we, we sort of do this, this log transformation, which I may or may not believe. Uh, one of the things that's really interesting <laughs> is that 36% of the observations are non-zero. So even aggregating up to these relatively large things, most of the world is unlit as observed uh, from outer space. Um, and here's the, here's the distribution of the, lits, of the lit things. So once we do this log transformation, the lit parts look relatively well behaved, I suppose you would say. Um, and then we're going to combine this with a bunch of other data. So a lot of our interest in this paper was kind of in assembling a, a, a set of tools of data that we can use in trying to understand uh, the determinants of uh, spatial distribution. So we divide our, our covariates into two sets. So one that we're going to call agriculture. Uh, so this has elevation and ruggedness. It has dummies for biomes. And I'll show you what the biomes look like in a second. Uh, temperature, precipitation, uh, the number of growing days, land suitability, which I'll also show you, uh, and latitude. And then the sec so this is supposed to be like stuff related to growing food, at least as well as we can uh, do such a thing. And then the second are kind of a, a set of variables that seem more, relative, more relevant to trade. So are you on a coast and the distance to the coast? Uh, we have this great data that I'm not going to talk about much today on natural harbors. So the United States Navy classifies, it measures all the harbors in the world, and it notes which of them are natural harbors. So, you know, instrument. Uh, <laughs> And uh, so we use that. Uh, ocean navigable rivers. This is data that Jeff Sachs and company used in a paper long ago. The underlying data is now lost, so we had to build it ourselves. Uh, so that's another contribution, and being on a large lake. Uh, this is the agricultural suitability data from Raman Cuddy et al. Uh, I just put this up because I just think it's really interesting. When you look at this, you understand the world a little better. Like, why are India and China such populous countries? Oh, look. They're big collections of really good land, and so they have a lot of people on them. Uh, and you know, similarly, uh, you know, Europe seems to have a pretty good collection of, of land over there and, and uh, some places in the New World, and we'll come back to that as well. Um, and these are the biomes. Um, so these are defined by you know, ecologists in terms of the prevalent uh, crops as a function of climate and, and soil type. Uh, and stuff like that. We're going to put in dummies for all of these biomes in, in everything we do. And that's going to come out, it's going to be important, it's going to be relevant to this use of uh, country fixed effects for the following reason. If you look at um, this kind of orangish one, uh, this tropical and subtropical grasslands, savannas, and shrublands, that appears almost entirely in Africa. And it makes up a fairly large part of Africa. And we worried about that because we're trying to get the effects of nature. But here's a form of nature that mostly appears in Africa, and we know that Africa's poor. So you might worry that what we're going to do is we're going to conclude that, that sort of this orange is just a bad biome, uh, and it, it leads to poverty or low population density. Um, and what we'd really be picking up is an Africa effect that could be due to any number of things, not necessarily to the land. Um, that problem is going to be much mitigated when we use country fixed effects. Because there, if countries in Africa are poor, then the country fixed effect is going to pick that up and let the biome pick up nature. All right, I should have waited a second. So one question to ask with this is just, OK, we have this lights data. We have these measures of first nature characteristics. How far can it get you? It's like a game. How high can I get the R squared by putting in, well, it's, uh, you know, I, you applied micro people, you're all about T statistics. But R squareds are important, too. So, so uh, how? Much of the variation in lights in the world can I explain just with these first nature characteristics. And in fact, when I'm, I'm not going to show you the underlying covariates. We have about 20, uh, no, I'm sorry, with the trade and the agriculture things, we have about 25 variables on the right hand side of our equations. And when you see the paper, which doesn't exist yet, you can see all the coefficients. Um, but it's kind of impressive 
that we can get the R squared up pretty high. So if we uh, put in our agriculture and trade variables together, it gets the R squared up to 46%. So uh, I thought that was uh, pretty impressive. And then the other thing that I think is impressive is that, okay, so country fixed effects by themselves explain a third of the variation. That's not that surprising because we know that there are these big differences um, between countries and their levels of income per capita. But what's impressive is say when you go from here to here, so even holding constant all the things that are constant about countries like institutions and, and, and so on, um, natural characteristics still explain a further, uh, whatever it is, 23% of the aggregate variance in the spatial distribution of lights. So nature is sort of really uh, telling us uh, quite a lot here. Okay. And, I, and, and so here, this is kind of like, how should we think about these country fixed effects? This is really kind of just what I said before. You know, if we didn't have country fixed effects, you might say, well, I, I might find all these correlations between climate, and geog climate type variables, biomes, and income per capita. But I might worry that all I was picking up was, hey, the Europeans were rich, and the Europeans went out, and they kind of conquered the world. And in places that looked like Europe, they set up settler colonies, and those settler colonies turned out to be rich. And in places that didn't look like Europe, they set up uh, exploitive institutions, and so those places turned out to be poor. And it's not, really the bio, it's not really the geography itself that matters. It's just you know, sort of this historical pattern that Europe did this. But once we put in country fixed effects, um, we're, we're kind of uh, holding all of those type of things that might be associated with Europeans uh, constant. Um, and then the cool thing is um, putting in the country fixed effects doesn't change the coefficients on the nature variables much. And I, we have to be a little careful here because we're, we're kind of taking this approach of throwing in a lot of different natural characteristics. So we throw in these biome dummies, we throw in precipitation and temperature and grow days separately. And so kind of our, our finite values are a mix of all those things. But here's just looking at some biome uh, dummies. Uh, I don't really know what all of these things mean. Uh, I know that Mediterranean is the really nicest climate. Um, and uh, you can see here's the coefficient uh, with no country fixed effect, and here's the coefficient with a country fixed effect. So in general, things that, that you know, look good uh, without country fixed effects also look good with country fixed effects. And I'll show you some, some more things uh, about that later on. OK. Um, here's the. Um, predicted the fitted value. So as I said, there's so many right-hand side variables, and, and so many of them measure similar things that it's hard to interpret the coefficients. I think it's much easier to just interpret uh, fitted values. So here's the fitted values uh, from our regression. So here, green is predicted to be the most lit. So you can see that's like Europe and, and the eastern United States and China and India, uh, and say Uruguay and, and Argentina. Um, and red is the least lit. So these are from the model without fixed effects, and these are from the model uh, with fixed effects. So there are differences. So without fixed effects, you're getting what I talked about before, that sort of you know, these, these African geographic characteristics are predicting a great deal of, of low light. Uh, once we put in country fixed effects, some of that goes away, but the general pattern uh, is quite similar. Uh, and here it is for the United States, just because you know, I know the geography of the United States well. Uh, in fact, I know it so well, I'm not going to talk about it more. <laughs> uh, and here's something else I'm going to talk about super briefly because I'm, how much time do I have? Oh, no one's keeping time. It's fantastic. Sorry? 15? Okay, then I'm going to talk about this super briefly. Maybe I'll, <laughs> you don't want to see it when I talk quick. These guys can tell you. <laughs> so, um, so this is just sort of looking, you know, you can break down the, our ability to predict lights into an intensive margin and an extensive margin. So. Um, this is kind of the, the regressions that I showed you already with no country fixed effects and country fixed effects. Here we're just putting in a dummy for being lit. And here we're putting in radiance conditional on being lit. And roughly speaking, these R squareds are bigger than those R squareds, which says that we do a better job of predicting that places have light than we do in predicting variation in light. And if you think about it, that, that kind of makes sense because if you go here, so here are the predicted values for the United States. You know, this is kind of capturing the general idea that these parts of the United States are generally kind of more densely populated than you know, the, the arid plains or the, or the mountains or something like that. 
But if you looked at the actual United States, you would note that there were all these kind of centers of agglomeration. And so that produces a lot of variation in the degree to which places are lit. And that doesn't come through our fitted values. We don't have the, the, the predictors that could possibly capture that. OK, so now we get to the main course with 15 or 20 minutes left. So what we're interested in in this paper is how the path of development that a country has, follows, has followed is going to affect the spatial distribution of population in the country. So think about first a world with no spatial inertia. So where the past didn't matter, where every day we could reset the entire uh, chessboard. So in that world, the fraction of the population urbanized is just going to depend on agricultural productivity. When agricultural productivity is high, we have more people urbanized. The number of cities is going to depend on this agglomeration congestion trade-off, <coughs> as well as transportation costs. So if agglomeration is uh, really valuable, then we're going to end up with kind of a few big cities if transport costs aren't too high. And then the location of the cities is going to depend on transport costs and on the extent to which some places are naturally better for producing output in than others. So for, you know, just kind of as a thought experiment, imagine that, that um, there are no congestion effects, so that bigger cities are always better, and that transport costs are super low. Well, in that case, what you're going to have is everyone who's urbanized is going to live in one city, and they're going to get food from everywhere else. Um, but then as you kind of turned these other knobs, as you kind of raise the congestion costs or raise the transport costs, you would get a different spatial distribution. That's all in a world without spatial inertia. Then in a world with spatial inertia, the history of these things matters as well. What fell first, transport costs or congestion costs or so on? OK, so that's the general model. Here's the narrow model. I'm not going to do the model in math because it's an evening talk and because we haven't gotten the math to work yet. We got the pictures. <laughs> <laughs> pictures are working really well. <laughs> OK, so there are two goods. People consume agriculture and a manufactured good. There are going to be two regions, which we're going to call the coast and the interior. Um, so we're sort of thinking about you know, a canonical African country here, if you like. Uh, the coast is better for manufacturing. So you can think about the coast as, as kind of having access to world markets and technology and trade and stuff like that. Um, it doesn't have to be a lot better for manufacturing, but it's just somewhat better uh, for manufacturing. There's no difference between the regions and their ability to produce agricultural goods. Um, population is going to move between the regions such that utility is equalized. So they're going to kind of people can move. Uh, even if goods sometimes can't move. And then for this version of the model, each, each region can have at most one city. So we've got kind of a nascent city location on the coast and a nascent city location in the interior. And those cities are going to have some size and they're going to have some agricultural hinterland around them. And there are going to be two dimensions of technology that can change over time. So I'm going to think of A as being agricultural productivity. So as countries develop, as time goes by, agricultural productivity rises, and that means more people can work in manufacturing. And then secondly, tau is going to be the cost of interregional trade. So in this simple setup, there's no cost in getting the food from the area around the interior city into the interior city, but there's a cost of getting the food from the interior to the coast or vice versa. Okay? So in the pre-development era, in the old days, agricultural productivity is low, so most people work in agriculture, and transport costs are high, so there's no interregional trade. In the developed era, or the end state of this model, agricultural productivity is high, so most people work in manufacturing and live in cities, and transport costs are low, so it's possible that we're going to observe interregional trade. Okay? So um, this is just kind of the production and preferences. So agriculture uses land and labor and has constant returns. And the preferences are going to be rigged such that as people get richer, uh, you know, the, your ability to eat is limited by the size of your stomach. And so they consume more uh, manufactured goods. Manufacturing takes place in cities. And manufacturing is going to be subject to both positive agglomeration effects and negative congestion effects. And the model is rigged so that you get a picture that looks like this. If I look at city population here and manufacturing productivity or the wage of people who work in manufacturing, uh, when a city starts to grow, we benefit from agglomeration. Uh, and so the wages of everyone rise from all of these nice externalities and thick markets and stuff like that. 
Uh, but once the city passes a certain size, then we're on this downslope, and congestion is actually outweighing uh, agglomeration benefits. OK. So uh, the equilibrium of the model is going to be that individuals move between regions and between occupations, such that utility is equalized for everyone, the two possible locations and the two possible occupations. Um, and then we're not going to model the inertia part formally, but we're going to sort of wave our hands and say that sort of the, where people are located uh, early in the development process is going to kind of keep them located there, unless they have a good reason to move. Uh, so it's going to determine which of the multiple equilibria are selected. So this is, model comes from Brown University, so they're multiple equilibria. <laughs> you all knew that. Um, so let's first think about the equilibrium with low A and high T. So this is the old days. So in the old days, most people work in agriculture, and transport costs are high, so the coast and the interior are isolated from each other. Each one is in autarky. And so what you're going to have, oh, but people can move. So we're being a little cheating here. So you can't move goods, but people can say, gee, you know, there's people in the, in the interior really have a much better life than us, so we're going to migrate. Okay. So um, what you're going to have are kind of small city populations in both the interior and the coast. Um, and the manufacturing productivity is going to be equalized uh, between the two of these. And I realized after I drew this picture that really this curve for the coast should be a little higher up because I said that the coast was more productive. But it's epsilon more productive, so that's why you don't see it in this picture. <laughs> so that's the equilibrium when A is low and tau is high. When we're in the developed case, so where A is high and tau is low, there are going to be two possible equilibria. Okay? Actually, three, but two types of equilibria. So one possibility is that we can have a symmetric equilibrium where, in both cases, city populations are big. Both of these cities are beyond their optimal size. And so uh, there's, the system is stable in the sense that if people moved uh, from here to here, that would lower utility of people in the interior and raise utility of people on the coast, and so people would want to move back. So we can have a symmetric equilibrium uh, where there's manufacturing in both places. There's agriculture in both places. I'm not showing that to you. There could be trade or there could not be trade. I mean, since, since the two places are identical, there's no reason for there to be trade. But there's another possibility when A is high and tau is low, and that is that we get this corner solution in which no one lives in the interior city and in which uh, all the manufacturing takes place at the coastal city, and agriculture takes place in both of these places. You don't see it. And these utilities are not equalized because no one lives in the interior city. So those, and then of course, then there's a third equilibrium where this red dot's over there and this red dot's over there. Okay. So um, how do we get from this initial equilibrium where um, there's low agricultural productivity and high trade costs to one of these two equilibria, well, there are two different paths that we can think of. So you can think of A rising before tau falls, or you can think of path number two, tau falling before A rising. Okay, so those are sort of the two different development paths that we're going to think of. So if A rises before tau falls, so here we are in our initial equilibrium. A rises, that means more people leave the farm and go to the city. But transport costs are still high, so each region is going to have to fend for itself. So I'm going to get large cities in both the coast and the interior. And then later on, when I reduce transport costs, even if I raise A more, I'm going to end up in some final equilibrium that is symmetric. So because the cities grew up when transport costs were high, we're going to have cities located uh, in both places. By contrast, if tau falls before A rises, so here again, the yellow is our initial position. When we reduce tau, we still have to have most people doing farming, but it would be unstable to have two equally sized cities. So one of those cities is going to be selected to have everyone move to it. And that's why we say the coast is slightly more efficient, so we think that's going to happen on the coast. So this intermediate stage is going to have a big coastal city and uh, no one in an interior city. And then when agricultural productivity rises, we end up in that other equilibrium with a big coastal city and no interior city. So that's our theory. I'm going to show you some data on this in a second. 
So in countries that agglomerated early, think France. Uh, A rose before T fell. We took path number one. Um, and thus, the current distribution of population, most of which is agglomerated at this point, reflects agricultural productivity. In countries that agglomerate later, transport costs fall before A rises. And so urbanization takes place along path number two, where we get the single large city. And therefore, the current distribution of population is going to reflect these trade possibilities, these things that I said made the coast more productive. Give me a reading on time, because I still got a lot of stuff. Five minutes. All right, I'll talk even faster. No, I don't have to talk faster. Okay. So how are we going to apply this to the model? So I'm going to use those, that set of variables that I call the agriculture variable to be the proxy for stuff that mattered for growing food in the old days. And I use those trade variables that are more like, how, those are the things that we think of as affecting sort of uh, stuff that mattered for late agglomeration. And so the model says that the ag variables should determine locations relatively more in early agglomerator countries than in later agglomerator countries. So now I have to sort out early agglomerator countries versus late agglomerator countries. And this is really all work in progress, so you know, forgive me if it makes no sense. Uh, so we're going to use two vet measures. So one is, whoops, one is education in 1950. So the idea here is that kind of countries that had a high level in education in 1950 were kind of mostly agglomerated by then. And countries that had a low level of education in 1950 are countries that were mostly not agglomerated at that point, and so they've been doing their agglomeration since 1950. Um, and then the other thing we look at is the ratio of population in 1950 to population in 1990. And let me just show you uh, cumulative distribution functions for those. So this is education in 1950. Um, so you, know, you can see 60% of the world's population had less than two years of schooling in 1950. That's the adult population. Um, and here's the distribution of population uh, ratio of 1950 to 1990. So countries here that have low numbers, like if you have a 0.2 here, it means that population increased fivefold over that period. Those are late agglomerator countries. Countries over, I mean, there's some weird islands over here, but countries over here, kind of near one, are countries that have just had 25% population growth since 1950. So those are the early agglomerator countries. So we're going to use those two. And then we're going to follow this Durloff and Johnson trick of letting the data choose a cutoff between early and late groups. So in particular, what we're going to do is we're going to loop through different division points of dividing, say, if I'm using education, I can divide at different points of education and call everything to the left a late agglomerator and everything to the right an early agglomerator. And we're going to choose the division point that maximizes the fit, that minimizes the sum of squared residuals when we run our predictive regression separately for the early agglomerators and the late agglomerators. So here's kind of the looping through picture. And we do this both with fixed effects and without fixed effects. Um, it's OK to put in country fixed effects, because remember what I'm doing is I'm dividing countries into two different bins. And then in each bin, I'm running a regression that has 100,000 observations in it. So it can have country fixed effects. That's not a problem. Um, so here you can see when we do education. In fact, I'm just going to do education for the rest of this presentation. Uh, when we do education, uh, we minimize the sum of squared residuals. at something like 3.6 years uh, when we don't have country fixed effects and at something like uh, three years uh, when we do have country fixed effects. Um, and here's the same thing for this uh, population ratio. Uh, the pictures don't look, the cutoffs don't look that different. Here it's four and here it's uh, 4.3 or something uh, when we have country fixed effects or when we don't have country fixed effects. And then Here's sort of the bottom line uh, from that exercise. So uh, let's look in the case of education. And so when we're looking at education greater than or equal to 3.6 years, so these are what we're calling the early agglomerator countries. And here's the R squared from our standard regression, just using the agriculture variables or just using the trade variables. And then here's the same regression run for the late agglomerator countries. Again, the R squared using the ag variables we're using the trade variables. And so what you can see very nicely is that when we move from um, the early agglomerators to the late agglomerators, agriculture becomes less important and trade becomes more important. 
And we didn't, I didn't even actually, these didn't have to go in opposite directions. I really just wanted agriculture to become relatively less important, but it's kind of nice. Um, and then here's the same thing uh, when we do country fixed effects. Again, the effect of agriculture goes down, and here the effect of trade goes up uh, only slightly. And this thing that in this thing is called SW, uh, this is that ratio I talked about before. Uh, so this is a ratio of population in 1950 to population uh, in 1990. So the countries where it's greater than 4.3, these numbers here, the 3.6 and the 3 and the 4.3 and the 4.4, uh, those were the cutoffs that were determined by this durloff johnson type procedure. So when we look at the early agglomerators compared to the late agglomerators, the importance of agriculture goes down, the importance of trade goes up, and that holds uh, even with country fixed effects. Um, and then sort of the last thing we do is just look at fitted values uh, for that. I can't remember what else. Okay, so here's the U.S. and here's the world. Um, so let me just do this one. So this is the baseline specification with country fixed effects. So I, I believe the stuff with country fixed effects more. And what we're looking at here is the difference in predicted values. Oh, shoot. That's what I want. The difference in predicted values for education greater than three years relative to education less than three years. So we run the regression. We say, how should the United States be settled if it was an early agglomerator? versus how should it be settled if it was a late agglomerator. And green are places where, as an early agglomerator, the United States should have more people than as a late agglomerator. And red and orange are places where, as a late agglomerator, the United States should have more, pe more people than an early agglomerator. So the fact that the United States was an early agglomerator is not really important. I'm just doing this because I know the geography of the United States. And so what you can see is, if the United States was an early agglomerator, it should have more people in this kind of interior, good agricultural land. And if you remember the Raman Cuddy picture, there's a big old chunk of good land here. Uh, then it should, as a late agglomerator, as a late agglomerator, it should have more people on the coasts. Uh, I guess that's really it, maybe to, to some extent in the river valleys, uh, than it does as an early agglomerator. And here's the same thing. Uh, for the world as a whole. Um, so I'm really, I mean, we're still kind of trying to teach ourselves how to interpret these things uh, properly. Um, uh, but again, you see, this is the same thing for the United States. So these greens are all places where as late agglomerators, I'm sorry, as, as early agglomerators, they should have more people. These are sort of the traditional places. And interestingly, to me at least, Europe looks like a place that's actually more favorable, even though Europe, of course, was an early agglomerator, Europe looks like a place that's more favorable for late agglomerate. It, has, it is rich in characteristics that are suitable for late agglomerators rather than early agglomerators. Um, so that's it. This is work in progress. Um, I think it's really cool. Um, and. Uh, Thank you for listening. We'll, we'll now take questions. Uh, thank you so much, Professor. I'm, both, uh, I'm just wondering about something recently learned. Uh, it's uh, about the theory of increasing returns by uh, Easterly, which says basically that um, sometimes people would prefer to live next to other people with um, similar levels of education uh, because they are more concerned than that. And therefore, to what extent does this particular explanation fit into the model that you have just presented? It explains the persistence of conversations uh, across, uh, across regions and across time. Okay, so uh, it says here, please repeat questions. <laughs> so, <laughs> big letters. Um, so, the, so as I understand the question you're asking is, is Easterly talks about um, uh, getting utility or productivity from living near people who have the same levels of education. Yes, and therefore, just to be clear, whenever the levels of education rise, people with these levels of education will tend to go into the areas where there's more education. And there is more returns on that one. Um, 
And uh, usually these are the places where they are correlated with better income. And we have seen the better income, and we have seen also correlated with better life, the, the life um, So how does that tend to explain the persistence of corporation across time, and how does that fit? Okay so, okay, so you're asking how it explains the persistence of agglomeration over time and also just how it fits into the general story. So I think the second of those is pretty easy. I think it's, it's very much of a piece with the general story. So, um, you know, if you, if you, again, if you look at my alien friends and you kind of try to explain to them, like, what goes on in cities, you know, you'd say, well, cities are, are places where people interact in all these productive ways, they publish newspapers, or they do R&D, or, or so on, and so on. And they're activities that benefit from having a lot of other people specialized uh, around them. And so I guess, it, I guess what I'm trying to say is that high human capital activities tend to be those activities that profit from agglomeration, right? So if you're, you know, doing some very low skill uh, occupation, it's not going to help you that much to have other people doing that low skill occupation nearby you. And so given that um, there is congestion in cities and that cities have a lot of disamenities from that, uh, a person who's not educated is going to find it much less valuable to live in a city than a person who is educated. And so cities are going to be richer not only because they have these productive externalities, but also because there's this sorting going on. Um, and so high human capital people are willing to pay the price to live in cities so they can be near other high human capital people. So that's, that's sort of the agglomeration part. Now what that has to do with persistence is less clear because presumably you know, all the smart people in New York could kind of get together and say, well, let's just go agglomerate somewhere else. Um, now, I mean, maybe that's just a silly idea. Um, but I don't think it's the human capital that is what kind of gives cities their inertia. Um, I think it's, 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 it's more mundane things, like, you know, it's just hard to coordinate on where we would all move or something like that. Other questions? Yes. So um, um, thank you for the, for the talk. Um, I'm struck by the um, the Almost an inversion, right? From the picture, almost an inversion from the picture you started out showing us, which is Europe was the most left. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and this is suggesting a slightly different configuration, um, if, I, if I'm following you correctly. I'm, I'm wondering though whether you can explain why um, the European experience by the fact that they are benefiting from an exercise of political power, which enables a kind of earlier agglomeration than we would have expected because they're relying on political power to funnel, funnel in the kind of the agricultural benefits from elsewhere. Does that make sense? No, that, that, that makes sense. I think, um, I mean, okay, so, so sorry to repeat the questions. <laughs> so, um, so at least part of the question that you asked is, um, well, so first you asked about sort of this inversion, which, which I'm not going to explain to you because it's a puzzle to me, uh, <laughs> of why it is that, you know, obviously Europe agglomerates first and is rich, and yet according to this um, thing of looking at predicted values, Europe actually seems to have, um, be particularly rich in the characteristics that lead to uh, concentration of population under late agglomeration. So, you know, I don't know. <laughs> the other question you asked is, to what extent is Europe's agglomeration made possible by the projection of political power over the rest of the world? And, you know, sort of in the terms of the model, uh, bringing in the food from elsewhere so that they can kind of have agglomeration themselves. So, in, in the crudest terms, I don't think that's right, simply because um, prior to the 19th century, you couldn't ship food any appreciable distance. It was simply too expensive. So it's only in the 1840s um, uh, that shipping becomes cheap enough that you know, uh, an appreciable part of Europe's calories uh, are coming from outside of Europe. I mean, it's true Europe is getting sugar from the Caribbean um, you know, in, the, in the 
uh, 16th century and onward, but that's a very, very small part of the food budget, a very, very small part of the calorie budget. Um, you know, that being said, obviously, um, there is, in, you know, there's something in the history that's not present in our simple model about how agglomeration in some places interacts with agglomeration in other parts of the world. And, you know, it would be foolish to say that, that you know, sort of the fact, you know, Europe's growth after 1500 uh, is divorced from what Europe did in the rest of the world. I mean, they brought back a lot of money. Uh, they brought back a lot of gold. They, they used that political power to make themselves, you know, richer and, and more bright from space. But, not, but the food, not until the 19th century. Just an observation, it's not really a, a um, criticism or anything. I, when, I, when I think about at least the, the Indian uh, subcontinent and about the transportation costs versus the agricultural potential, they seem to sort of go together in the sense that you've got the Gangetic Plain, it's fertile, you've also got the Ganges River, which then you can actually move along. And I wonder, so in that context, I would think it's kind of hard to tease out the different, different effects of Tao versus agriculture. And I wonder, is that like a common problem for you in other parts of the world or? Okay, so I'm supposed to repeat that as a question. <laughs> so, so the question is, is you know, uh, what about places like the Gangetic Plain where, you know, it's both fertile and transport is easy? So, I mean, I th a lot of my thinking about this paper was really shaped by this picture from the Raman Cuddy data. Um, here we go. Okay, so, um, you know, there's the Gangetic Plain, um, and so it's this big swath of good land. Um, and then here's, you know, kind of the, uh, the American Midwest and the Mississippi Valley and the upper Midwest, and it's also this really good land. And so, you know, why is it that the Gangetic Plain is so densely populated and Iowa's not? And so my answer to that, which is sort of what I try to incorporate into this model, is that when the Gangetic Plain was being settled, agricultural productivity was low. So forget about transport costs. You needed the people, you needed the agricultural workers to live near the land because you know, each person could produce enough food for a little more than one person. So, you know, you could have some cities, um, but most people had to farm. And then I guess transport costs were still high enough, even, you know, even though it's, it's uh, geographically a place that's good for transport, you know, we're talking about an era in which transport technology is still not good. And so the cities are kind of near where the farmers are uh, you know, because you want to rule over them and take their surplus so you can have your city. And that's all tied down by the good land. Now, when Iowa is resettled, so, you know, as we, as we saw earlier today, the Native Americans are pushed out. And, you know, European descended uh, Americans uh, come in. And by the time Iowa is settled, agricultural productivity is much higher and transport costs are low. So people in New York can eat the pork that's raised in Iowa. And so that's why we don't have this dense population in Iowa. So that's sort of, it was exactly the Gangetic Plain that actually got me thinking about a lot of these issues. Yes? Um, if we could look at your, the predicted values again. I mean, what, one thing that's really striking about it in, in some of the areas is how, th this isn't the one that- Oh, which, you want the, the one from the very end, which yeah, is the- one very end. Right, so the one at the, just to be clear, the one at the very end is, is the difference in predicted values from my two specifications. Oops. And so, so what's interesting about it is, is, as you pointed out in just towards the end of your talk, how it looks like uh, Europe, and even more so Greenland, uh, <laughs> is, is an ideal place for, for uh, later agglomerate. Uh, wait, no, just to be clear, it's, what, what's, what's being looked at here is not the fitted values, it's the difference in the fitted values. So it says that Greenland is particularly much better for later agglomeration 
than it is for early agglomeration. And, and it's yet to come. Well, no, 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 because it, it could be that it could be that the fitted values for both are very small. Yeah. So it's, it could be a bad place by both, but it's just in a particularly bad place by the old ones. But when we look at Europe, so looking at Europe is the, I mean, Greenland is just kind of a funny one to look at. But Europe, Europe's quite interesting. And what it makes me think is, well, but Europe wasn't a late agglomerator. It was an earlier agglomerator. And so your, your model might suggest that. And so we see it's contradicted by the historical fact. And so maybe there's something in the model that's just not picking up what caused it. And so your model assumed equal technology in all regions. But that wasn't true with Europe. I mean, so part of the reason, maybe what you've got here, what's interesting about this picture is where we see discrepancy between this picture and, histor and the historical record. It leads us to look for what aspects of your model are not true that help us to understand and explain the different patterns of urbanization. I, no, I, I accept that. I won't try to repeat that question, but I, but I accept it. I mean, I think, you know, we're, by putting in country fixed effects, we're kind of getting out of the game of why Europe agglomerates first. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you, it, it could be, and, and this is really just thinking out loud, that Europe had these characteristics that would be the valuable characteristics later on. I suppose that's kind of the Jeff Sachs view, that you know, Europe has the large coastlines and the natural harbors and the easy transport. But the way, but, but nonetheless, I think what's interesting about the story is that Europe agglomerates at a time where these things that would be its advantages are not yet advantages. Right, so you know, think about France. I mean, France, you know, uh, is is you know, the time of the Napoleonic Wars is is dense and, and rich and the most important country in Europe, and it's not because it's doing trade with the, the developing world or anything. It's it's just about its own characteristics, and yet France is endowed with these characteristics that seem to be valuable in subsequent periods. Uh, that's like I have to think about that. That's all. So, um, so I think Ed Glazer has this paper, A World of Cities, and he coins this phrase, urbanization out of desperation. Um, and I was just wondering if you could potentially use your model to think about, maybe this would be relevant for climate change and agricultural productivity not going up, but actually going down, how that would affect not like a pull into an urban center, but like a push into an urban center. Yeah, I mean, I think, okay, so repeat the question. <laughs> so, you know, Ed Glazer has this story about, as he said, urbanization out of desperation. So, you know, people can't support themselves on the land uh, and are pushed into cities. I mean, I think, you know, in this story about why the coast is more productive, you know, we kind of have in our mind, um, again, we're thinking, you know, about African countries because they're urbanizing rapidly. Um, and, it's certainly this interesting characteristic that um, coastal African cities uh, don't have to rely on the interior for food, right? So there's some, I can't remember whose paper this is, but it's, it's you know, cheaper to move grain from New Orleans to Dar es Salaam uh, than it is to move grain from the interior of Tanzania to Dar es Salaam. So, um, you know, it's not present in our model, but, but a coastal city can kind of detach itself entirely from the interior, and that's going to give extra impetus uh, to this kind of development. And I think that's part of what we're picking up in sort of finding that for these late developing cities, I'm sorry, for these late developing countries, trade is a big determinant uh, of urban location. So uh, it's a kind of bizarre thing to think about um, that, that in poor countries, you know, people in poor countries may actually just end up being fed from the American Midwest. Um, the United Nations and Professor Jeffrey Sachs and uh, people around him, they are working on sustainable development goals today. Sustainable, sustainable development. Sustainable development goals. 
SDGs okay. for the next 15 years. So after the MDGs now, they're working to uh, come up with sustainability of agriculture, ag uh, including urbanization, including transportation, which the, they were missing elements of Millennium Development Goals. But um, I want to know, what do you think about um, their, um, um, about the Sustainable Development Goals, whether after 15 years, uh, um, countries will be able to overcome some solutions based on what you explained here? Or they contribute to um, um, equality, to um, agriculture sustainability, to um, less urbanization, but more uh, productivity, so, uh, which the Sustainable Development Goal will talk about later. Right. Um, okay, to, repeat, to repeat the questions, you're asking about the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, I, I mostly have to pass on that, so. Uh, I don't, I mean, I, th I think I, I would go back to, to what I said in, in response to Marcello's question, which is um, that what's one dimension of urbanization, again, in Africa, I think that, that's sort of so interesting from a economic growth perspective, is the extent to which countries that are so poor are urbanizing in the context of sort of not producing, not necessarily producing food uh, to, feed, to feed the cities. Um, I suppose, you know, kind of our, our simple model says that in the end, Africa is going to look like the United States with um, very productive agriculture using not a lot of people and almost everyone else urbanized. Um, and, uh, I, I don't see. I don't see how anything else could be a long-run outcome. Um, at the same time, it seems like it's sort of it's hard to imagine a lot of African cities absorbing these very large rural populations that still exist. But I don't have any wisdom on it. Okay, last question. Um, so this exercise, and especially going back to the X square table. Um, in these two groups, and there's way, in some ways, you get our squares that vary because, you know, the left-hand side variable is a lot of variation, and the right-hand side ones don't, or vice versa. And in some ways, you worry a little bit about the properties of the countries with in these different bins, just having very different variations in the right-hand side variables relative to the left-hand side. So think of Europe, for example. Europe, not probably a lot of variation in the light variable relative to Mongolia or something like that, where you got a few, or China, so, okay? Um, you got these two pictures, the picture at the end, China looks very different than Europe, right? China's all green, Europe's all brown, right? In the fitted values. In the fitted values. In the, in the difference in the fitted the values. Difference in the difference in the fitted values, but, so I'm thinking of those two. It just seems to be you almost would want to scale the right-hand side variables by understanding the deviation, just so you don't get artificial you're getting betas in both bins, right? But, but scaling the, so I, well, so, I, so I agree with you that there's all sorts of wacky things that could be happening here, and I'm worried about them too. Right. But scaling the right-hand side variables by their standard deviations isn't going to change the R squared, right? That's just going to change the betas. Well, it's, it's, but I'm worried that the R squared you get comparability is dependent in some ways about the very underlying differences in the, vari in the variances in the two types to the two bins. So Europe would be less variation in light density, but a lot of variation in the geography. China, lots of variation in luminosity, less variation in the geography, right? And then you get very different outcomes, very different pictures. And I haven't thought through this all, but China and Europe, in, in circa 1950, China would be in one bin, Europe would sure. be in the other. Right? Yes. So, um, so I, there seems to be something there where these are, yes, you're getting the same you know, linear projection at the end of the day. There's betas, right? Um, well, the betas are being estimated separately for the two yes, bits. Yes, that's what I'm saying. It's the, if I have a cloud in a two dimensional world, clouds would look, I think, very different in China versus Europe. Yes, you get, and I know I'm not being careful here, 
So therefore, you should expect higher R squareds. Well, it, it's the DF on beta. The, based on the characteristics of future change, you probably. It's the absolute <laughs> average DF beta higher for a Chinese pixel than is a European the, pixel. Is the absolute average DF what? beta? DF beta higher for what's a Chinese. Sorry, what's DF beta? The the yeah. degree to which any one observation swings the uh, coefficient. Oh my God, I have no idea. <laughs> so if the, if the variation, the left hand, side, if the ratio of left hand side variation to right hand side variation is really big in China and really small in Europe, then a little movement in right hand side variable is going to push the left hand side variable a whole lot in China, not very much in Europe. And so whatever characteristics explain differences across space in China are going to look really important, and whatever characteristics create variation across space in Europe aren't going to look important at all. And that's just because the left-hand side variable is swinging a whole lot more. Right, but that, that again sounds like a story about betas, not about R squareds. I mean, here's my, here's my other R squared yeah, defense. Yeah, I this is a story about betas. Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, my other defense is, but my other defense is, I mean, if you sort of just look at this block of four numbers, right, you know, I mean, you'd have to tell some very complicated story where the variance of agricultural variables in this group relative to this group is somehow very different than the variance of trade related variables. I think it could be actually. That's almost precisely it. You almost want to see that first to make sure that's not. But what would I show? I mean I have all the I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that's my of each pixel. Sorry? Recalculate the luminosity of each pixel, not in terms of deviations from country means, but in terms of standard deviations from country means. So you want me to set the variance in every country to be the same? Yeah. Yeah. That's what I was Set the variance of... It just, that's, that sort of struck me as you've got the relative variation is two places that are very different. So if, if you guys think that all I have to do <laughs> to make this paper finished is to set the variance of the. It sounds like a good suggestion. Uh, okay, unfortunately, we, we've run over. Uh, if there are individual questions, Professor Weil might have. Uh, Time to take a couple of them. Also, if there are any CD students who would like to come up and explain <laughs> the reason why Williamstown or Williams College has been here for a while is it's removed to other distractions and so you've been able to work so much harder and that will persist for a while, uh, feel free to do so. But otherwise, please join me.